just a minute past. So I think we'll we'll start and we'll just slowly do our introduction here while people are still getting at it. So welcome. Um, my name is Eric Olson. I'm a, a product owner here at the Center for Open Science, working particularly with OSF institutions, and that um, is our uh, call today is uh, in the series of, of community calls that um, are part of our community um, conversation with around OSF uh, institutions with the members of that group and we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about that um, in a little bit. I'm going to share my screen so we can walk through a few things together today. Make sure I got the right one up. Oops. Not what I wanted. So I think folks are still coming in. We're just going to go ahead and get started. Um, so our theme today is is really to talk about um, the OSF itself, uh, mostly, and and some of the features that uh, really make the the OSF um, a useful tool right now, in particular, in, in um, the ways that research teams, labs, university departments are, are operating in a, a different environment than they were uh, a year ago and, and maybe that than they've ever uh, worked in, at least uh, at scale. So we're going to talk about some of the things that the OSF um, enables uh, that can maybe can, can help you and help your stakeholders. Um, I know for a fact uh, in looking at the, the list of attendees, today that some of you would know a lot of this um, and already uh, um, share this these kind of resources or instruction uh, with your community. <clears throat> uh, so you will see some things that you know, maybe I can mix in a few things that um, you haven't seen before, or maybe some examples, some useful examples for you that um, you can use to, to share with your group. So we are going to just quickly um, talk a little bit about the, the Center for Open Science and, and the Open Science Framework, even though uh, many of you are very familiar with this, some of you are new. Um, so we'll quickly talk about what the Center does. Um, so uh, the OSF is a product of uh, the Center for Open Science. We're based in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, and we have, uh, at a high level, our mission is to increase openness, integrity, and reproducibility of research. We're uh, a nonprofit. Um, all of our work is open source and the OSF, uh, many of the things I'm going to show you today, um, all of the, the OSF uh, features for researchers, all free. Uh, OSF accounts are free to set up, um, free to be setting up all, all of their, their projects and their submitting preprints and registrations, things will talk about in a little bit. Um, we keep those free for researchers um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more uh, about how we do that in a, in a little bit. Um, and our structure as an organization is to really think about um, how change is enabled in a few different ways simultaneously knowing that just one of these uh, is not quite enough uh, to enable change. Um, so we have a policy team and their work is um, around uh, cultivating incentives uh, to uh, enable change, to embrace change across organizations and, and regions um, and to understand and share when those changes are happening. Um, and the research team that instead of just assuming that all of these policies are are working and that they're all great um, we have a, a research team a meta science team that is actually following up on all of that work so that we can actually demonstrate um, evidence of, of those changes of successes and possibly where things uh, don't work um, we want to have evidence for that to help us um, plan our future work with the policy team as well as the, the next team there the infrastructure team which is the OSF building um, a technology infrastructure that can enable any of this change uh, to uh, move forward in, in uh, concert with the culture change that is enabling that work. Here and with that, 
in mind. Uh, this is a, an image you've seen in some context or another um, over the years, certainly uh, the diffusion of innovations where we have, uh, this is not just in, in science and technology, we see this in, uh, in many contexts where there are innovators, there are early adopters that they really will, will jump into something that they see that there is potential as far as how it can improve their work or their practices. And they'll embrace that despite possibly um, bumps in the road as they um, sort of work to, to, to use those tools or, or um, understand, articulate its value. Lots of users bunched in, in the middle that um, are, will, will join and, and follow the successes of those early adopters. And then of course, uh, laggards that um, they do or will possibly uh, embrace those changes. They just might not do it as quickly as, as some of their peers. Maybe they need to be, uh, they need to see some of that work in action before they're um, reassured that it's actually right for their community. So if we, we tilt this over a little bit, it helps us think a little bit about um, more about how we work here at the center and what we're trying to encourage through the, uh, those several teams that I, I mentioned before. At the, the base um, of this pyramid here and, and to support those innovators who would, will jump in and try cool new things, we have to, to make that possible. So we'll will build and, and uh, enable a technology that will we'll have some of those real excited uh, early adopters and, and uh, innovators um, jump in and, and try those new things with the technology that's available to them. And then in order to, to continue to get, get more of those uh, adopters, maybe they, they're excited about it as, a, as an opportunity, but they need just a little more help and uh, being able to actually use those tools. So being able to iterate, make the interfaces and the experiences uh, even better. If we make it easy more, we'll, we'll take part. Um, and then the, you know, a real exciting part being right, right in the middle here um, of the pyramid is work in the community. So you can build the greatest, most interesting technology of all time, but if you built it for, you know, somebody that doesn't exist, then it's probably not a great tool um, or it's not a useful one um, if there's no one there ready to use it. So communities are a huge part of this in helping us understand where the technology even has to go, who's using it and, and how they're using it. Um, and then on the other hand, on the other part of that equation, the, the communities can take that technology and uh, um, make it normative in that they it becomes a, a part of their community uh, activity, their workflow, their discussions, their conversations happen around those practices. It's assumed that having a DOI or uh, data sharing as a practice or data as its own object, um, that only works if the communities embrace those as an activity they're willing and, and uh, encouraging. And then incentives, communities can embrace those things, but they're not everyone in the community is gonna jump right in right away, people are busy. Um, but if you make it rewarding to take place and uh, to take part in data sharing or transparency, then um, even more of that community are gonna uh, take part. And then finally, um, if, you, if it really comes down to it and uh, researchers maybe resist practices in some cases, but if you tie it to their funding or to their tenure through policy and incentives, uh, they're much more likely to, to listen and, and try some of those things. And again, we want to learn from their experiences so that we can uh, come back and revisit the infrastructure and make it even better for them. So with all of that uh, in mind, we have really been thinking, uh, as you have, um, about the, the challenges of, of going remote. Likewise, we are remote over so a team that uh, a little over 30 uh, people that very much were dependent on uh, being in person and working together uh, in the office and had to make a, an adjustment um, to, to all working separately. And um, some of the challenges we face, I'm sure you hear a lot about um, communication is just the technology itself is not always as consistent as we might 
hope that people have different means uh, of communication at different times based on where they're going to be. Um, the loss of passive knowledge sharing, which is a fancy way of saying, um, you know, the water cooler, we're not passing each other in the hall anymore with the, you know, what's, what's new this week. I just heard about your, your work. Tell me a little bit more about that. That's not happening, uh, at least not easily right now. Uh, tool gaps, some uh, individuals on your team may have access to uh, tools or resources that other members don't, which make coordination and collaboration that much more difficult. Uh, and then lack of organization and management, this is not being a personnel management, but um, management in terms of um, if everyone has different resources, how are we going to coordinate writing our narrative or um, editing our uh, the protocols on our, for our experiment or uh, submitting our, our data management plan, that all becomes a little more difficult when we can't sit around the table and, and talk about it with the same tools in hand. So can the OSF help with these things? I think so, and, and um, this obviously is, is somewhat dependent on um, how your communities already interface with these tools and tools like it. So I can't, I'm not gonna promise you that the OSF solves all your problems because I doubt that it solves everything that you're going through right now, but I do think um, it can help you or help your stakeholders with a number of these things that, a uh, number of those challenges that we've identified. So we're gonna talk about a few of these today um, where collaboration can be um, facilitated you know, with the OSF, some of the project management and contributor tools there. I'm going to show you a few of those. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about the wiki and how um, that tool can provide uh, context for all of the, the cool things that your researchers are sharing or want to share. And then finally, I'll tell you a little bit about OSF institutions and how all of those things that we were going to show you today um, could, could possibly provide some insights to the institution itself um, and where all of those where all of that individual research or energy is, is going and contributing to. All right, so this is uh, the first uh, group of things that we're going to look at today um, involve uh, the project features of the OSF, um, managing collaborators. We'll look at, uh, at a few things in, we, with files in the OSF, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about how you, you think about your structure or about uh, how your research, whoops, how your researchers are thinking about structure. So this link right here, and I'm gonna drop it in the chat as well, is a uh, OSF project, a public project that I've put together just for us. And we will spend some time in it in just a moment. Let me find the chat here, make sure I send it to everyone. There you go. So you can follow along in there as we're um, as we go. So this is that project right there, that same link. Um, we use the term "good," which is we're not the only ones to use that term, but um, we use that a lot. So that is this uh, number right here. And every uh, uh, project and object preprint um, in the OSF, every file that you upload to your to your OSF account or project will get its own GUID, so it is an identifier unique to this project, despite many more like it. Um, none will have that same GUID. Um, and then what we want to talk about today is we provide a little narrative to this. So if I'm a new researcher, maybe I'm a, a lab manager at your institution, and I'm really looking for a way to coordinate some of the work that normally we would be doing um, in the lab. I can't get to my lab right now, so I need a little help um, coordinating some of that, that data sharing or some of the, the communication that used to happen, um, even writing physically on a, on a board or on, on a notebook. Um, how can I do some of this remotely and, and coordinated in such a way that uh, many of the resources are gonna be shared by the rest of my team. So there's a few things to keep in mind for the researcher to think about 
before um, they, they dive all the way into this, um, do they have data management uh, requirements from their, from their funder or from their institutions? Um, where are they going to be storing their data or do they need to communicate all of this information? Who is going to be participating and, and how are they going to be participating? Um, because all of those questions can uh, really determine how their, um, their OSF projects are structured. Um, so a few of those things that we'll look about, uh, look at here. I'm going to move some of the zoom boxes out of my way. So right uh, at the very beginning, this is sort of our, our home page for an OSF project. We can see a, that public projects and private projects are, are distinguished here. And I could switch these, um, I could switch a project from public back to private back to public. Um, obviously, in this case, I want it to remain public so that you can um, follow along. I'm going to use some of the resources here. Um, a private project will only be visible by myself and then others that I add as contributors, which I will show you in just a moment. Um, public, anyone, even if they don't have an OSF uh, account, will be able to come and, and read this information through the API. It would be accessible for someone to come and access some of my uh, files and my work here. Um, but if I want to continue to add more contributors to my project, I've got a couple of ways to look at our contributor list here. And so one is I can proactively um, add folks to this project. Um, I would look for, I'm going to look for my colleague here who's also on the line with us. I can find her on the OSF, add her as a contributor, and even then I have a few options. I want Claire to be participating, but what do I want Claire to do? Um, you know, she's maybe my, my newest you know, lab, uh, uh, lab member or lab participant. Maybe she's not ready to go in and start editing data yet. I can give her read-only uh, permissions so that she can access all of this uh, information on her project but can't make changes. Um, she could get read and write access. She can add new um, content to our project, but she can't delete my project or register my project uh, or administrator, which gives her um, all of those permissions plus the ability to, to delete and register projects, um, register this project. So I'm gonna go ahead and add Claire here. There we go. And I can change her permissions later if necessary. I can also determine if she's a bibliographic contributor. Um, I'm of the mind that most contributors should be bibliographic, but uh, obviously there are differences uh, for different communities and different needs where someone who's uh, administrating a project or um, is otherwise involved in, in getting this OSF project together can remove themselves as a, a bibliographic uh, a contributor, she won't show up um, on the contributor list. Um, another way that uh, that users can um, add them can request access to uh, a, a project, and this is particularly useful for cases, you know, if it can be a, a huge citizen science project or if it's um, coursework, then um, you can enable access requests. Um, so I think the coursework uh, cases are really cool here in that um, this project, we make this project available and share the link with all of my students. So I don't even have to know who all my students are. I could stick it on the syllabus and send it out. Um, they would go to that link and request uh, access to join my uh, OSF project here. And then they'll become contributors and that works for both um, public and private projects. So it's really useful for uh, collaboration at scale. So that is request access. Um, so a big part of, of structuring your OSF project is knowing what do I need to have in my, in my sort of home page here in my, the, uh, first page of my project, and then what are really separate 
um, pieces that maybe need, need to have its own um, control, can have its own contributors, have its own privacy settings. And uh, we do that through um, components. And when I go to add a new component, they really work uh, very similar to projects. So it has its own title, uh, its own license, its own contributors. And I have a few examples here um, that I've set up as um, use cases. We'll come back to these in a minute, but just to give you an idea, it looks very much like an OSF project, but um, it can have its own contributors. It can have different uh, affiliations and I can make this one private while leaving the rest of the project public. So if you have a data set, you want to have most of your work um, uh, visible and shared and out there in the community, but you have a data set that maybe is just not quite ready for that. It can't be public just yet for one reason or another. You can set up a component with private uh, that is private and that data is not available to, to everyone that comes through. Um, you can make it request only, only by request um, for individuals so that you can um, get a sense of when individuals actually want to come and use your work. Um, so one of the things bouncing off of, of that, you can actually get a sense of how, if you have um, lots of individuals that are coming, users that want to come and use your work, uh, we have an analytics page that can really give you a sense of where that activity is um, over, um, right now, over a month's time. And um, you can see in a couple of different metrics here, uh, measure the, the popularity or, or the impact of your, uh, your project. So forks are, um, this is actually a fork of a previous project that I had, had set up. It makes, like in, in GitHub, makes a copy of the, the project um, and keeps the, the content and the structure intact. Um, and then the, act, the original is kept um, as part of the citation here. So you can see it's forked from this original project and the day that it was forked from. So you get the, the data provenance there. And then um, links to this project. So if um, I continue to set up more workshops and want to use this as an example, I can continue to link to it so I can see um, how often that is occurring. Uh, and then projects that um, can also make templates or of other projects. So if I need, if I saw a really neat um, project that is set up for a, uh, as an electric lab notebook, for example, and I, I do have an example of this, I'll show you in just a, a few minutes. I don't need all of the content because this is gonna be for my own lab. Um, so instead I would make a template copy, which would uh, give me a copy of the structure of the project, but not bring over all of that content. And then some details in terms of um, the, the visits that you're having per day and where these visits are coming from. So right now we can see a lot of our uh, activities coming from the direct link that I just uh, sent you a few minutes ago. Um, some coming from uh, my account when they looked at my project list. And then some probably through a, a search or otherwise um, on the OSF site. So we're going to look at files here. So um, one of the, the advantages of uh, the OSF here is that I could set up the, this OSF project I've added. Claire, I could add all of you to this project. And no matter what, as long as you have a web browser, no matter what, your, uh, what kind of resources you have on your machine, all of this is going to be accessible to you, all of this content that I have here. Now I can structure it to make it easier for you to use um, or to, to recognize what its uh, utility is. Um, but you'll actually be able to open all of and use all of this, uh, this structure on your machine. And this includes the storage. So um, there's a couple of different ways to store information um, on the OSF or store files on the OSF. So we have OSF storage is a storage that we host. Um, we use Google storage for this. Um, and there is, as of right now, not 
a per project uh, storage limit on the OSF. There is a per file storage limit, so that only a, a file can only be up to five gigabytes um, when you're using OSF storage. And uh, this using OSF storage is is free as part of your account. Um, and when we go, we're going to pick the first file here. And it will, over 500 file types will render in the OSF. So again, you're not gonna need a certain special kind of software for the vast majority of, of files in order to actually access and, and read them um, in the OSF. And we have a few things that we see here, including um, a version history. This one only has the, the one version, but we could see uh, previous versions if those are available. Um, quick share link. Obviously, I have an administrative uh, capability, so I can delete these files. Um, if we have non-admin contributors, they won't be able to, to delete them, um, but would otherwise have access to them. And then this is a feature um, only available on, on OSF storage called Checkout, where um, if this is a file that um, we're passing around as a group, maybe it's a a grant application and we all need to, to have access and work on it. We're not going to do it in Google Docs um, for some reason or, or another um, synchronous platform. We need to have real close control. Um, so we obviously don't want to have any, everybody have a different version. They're all trying to compare and contrast them. Um, so instead you can have one here on the OSF, in this case a security overview document. I can check this document out and that means now I have access to this document and now no one else on this project will actually be able to make changes to it in the duration that I have it checked out. Um, so that may, helps to um, facilitate consistency across um, the project in terms of who has, who's working on this right now um, and when do we expect changes to occur. So OSF storage is, is one option here. Um, now what's really exciting is that, um, as we mentioned before, your research team or the researchers at, the, at your uh, university, they may have all kinds of different storage options that they rely on. You may have some that you use at an institutional enterprise level um, already at your institution that your researchers rely on. Uh, they don't need to copy and paste their files um, in order to get them from uh, Dropbox to the OSF because we have built what we call add-ons um, which are a way to um, to connect your files no matter where they're stored um, at least within these uh, add-ons here and connect them to your OSF projects and not just generally you can connect them very specifically where you want them. Uh, so you have an, o an OAuth process that you're probably very familiar with from using um, Google services and Orchid or others like that. Um, import, oops, that's not the one I want. I should probably uh, name those a little differently to help myself out here. All right, we'll just grab a document here from a uh, digital humanities conference from a few years ago. Maybe not. All right, well, that's not helping me. Um, so you can add your entire folders of your Google Drive content uh, to your OSF project just uh, from these add-ons. So you can do this multiple times. You can have lots of uh, folders that you include in this process so that if you have data across multiple uh, add-ons, you could centralize all of those here on the OSF, on your OSF project, and then move that data uh, between the different storage options and between the folders 
that you set up within your uh, project for um, organization. So if I create a new folder just for new data management plan so that I can keep track of where my plan documents in particular, uh, in particular are. So I can just move those around and get a, a nested structure just for my files there. And then if I need to actually take all of these files, not one at a time, but as a group, get these files and uh, download them. So I have lots of data we've been using, but I actually do need it on my hard drive now. Um, we can actually download these um, as, a, as a zip. We can delete these as a group, check out files as a group, um, even across multiple folders. Oops. At the project and the component level, you can create DOIs for these to make them um, easily shareable. The uh, project DOIs are all minted by data site. Um, registration DOIs are also data site um, and preprints. Those are minted by Crossref. Um, and then we have a number of different, uh, whoops, let's go back to our workshop uh, add-ons here, I mean, uh, project. Going back, there we go. So I have a number of different components I set up here. These are all different, very, very basic use cases I set up that might be useful to, to review and give you some ideas um, uh, about how some of your stakeholders might be looking to use um, the OSF in terms of organizing their, their work. Um, so one of the important parts of setting up your OSF project is you might have lots of different data or code in here um, is contextualizing what is going on, what, where, what are all these files about, um, what are, when you have all these different components, how am I supposed to use these? Um, we have a wiki that is specifically designed to provide uh, that kind of information and to be iterative and uh, have version control so that you can actually see how the project has evolved and maybe the structure has evolved over time. So there hasn't been a lot of changes between um, the two versions here, but you can actually compare multiple versions should there be, um, yes, there's a few of them here before. Um, you see where those changes have occurred over time and then the uh, edit function is uh, in markdown. So there's lots of flexibility in terms of what you can do um, to structure your wiki to, to illustrate how your project works and, and what um, it's gonna be used for. And so um, I've used the wiki to um, illustrate or to um, give you an idea of how that might help with different kinds of project structures. So this one, um, just a very simple template for um, a, a faculty member that might be using the OSF for course management. We see this quite a bit, in fact, um, and they will, um, you know, have used this as their syllabus and link to uh, various resources throughout the, the components, um, and then they'll use this wiki to, to give the, the guidance to what you should be using when this is linking to several of those different, excuse me, several of those different projects and components. And then you can embed, in this case, files from inside uh, the OSF. You can embed those right into your wiki so that if you have a really crucial um, image or, or video even that uh, describes your project or how to use your project, you can embed those right in there. Um, you can have a couple of different wikis, you can have many different wikis, if those will help to explain the different parts of your project. In this case, this one is blank, but let's go back and look at the structure here. So I have components for each of the different um, weeks of the, the duration, well, the first five weeks of the duration of this course. Um, and so each of those components can have different 
content. I don't know if I, oh yeah, I have a few things in here. Um, and you can have nested components. You have as many as is necessary to, um, to structure your project the way you need it to. Uh, and then this is an example of linking uh, an external project coming from, uh, I didn't build any of these. I, they are linked from, um, in this case, James Madison University has some really cool uh, classroom resources that they've developed. Um, these, I'm not sure where these are. This is about uh, formatting your, or managing your data to comply with um, NIH grants and um, some really neat stuff. So I, I have linked um, some of these to each of these different use cases, some examples to look at, and then these really basic templates as well. Now, one of the things that's changing um, as I so I'll move myself back to the project here, um, one of the things that we see uh, that we're going to see a change in very soon um, is the, uh, the user experience for the project pages and the files pages in particular. Uh, we're about to get a, a facelift right now. It's not the not the easiest thing to use. We get all, all of this, uh, all of our components and all of our information is listed here on this files page. It can be a little difficult to, to manage. Um, we have a um, new user interface for files that um, is more in, in line with the rest of the, uh, the OSF, much cleaner, um, much easier to navigate to the files that, uh, that you need. Um, the rest of the, the features will still remain the same. You still have the checkout and version history, just easier to get to those. Um, the metadata fields uh, page, get down just a little bit here, is also getting um, an adjustment to account uh, to make fair data uh, available for files. It's going to be exciting. I know a lot of you um, are busy with fair data initiatives uh, right now. Um, so those will be available pretty soon, including um, having funding grant numbers uh, for your files. That's very cool. Uh, so this is not available yet, but it's uh, in the very near future. Um, so that's a look at files, uh, file reboots. Let me just go back to our components here. We'll look at one of the other ones. So we get uh, quite a few uh, questions and we have quite a few cases of uh, using the OSF as an electric lab notebook. Um, ELNs are obviously a pretty important um, tool or resource for, uh, for labs uh, and there's lots of, of ways for them to, to create their own um, lab notebooks or electric lab notebooks. The OSF is valuable in that it connects to all of the other the other work that they may be producing um, in the lab or sharing. Um, they can link all of that together. So the wiki um, is about bringing all of those different phases um, potentially of a of a lab's workflow, um, linking to those in different uh, components, and then you know in this case also uh, embedded. We had a very specific webinar about OSF as an ELN that I've linked or embedded here um, that may be of interest, but the structure there is about getting, uh, if you're at the, the protocols phase of your, uh, your work in the lab, you know exactly where to go and uh, deposit your, your data, your protocol information. If you're at the data gathering phase, there's, um, there's uh, a component for that, materials and methods, results, um, so that there really is not any confusion in terms of um, where the data needs to, uh, or where your, your workflow um, needs to be at the next phase. Um, so with that, we're going to skip ahead just a little bit so that I have time um, just to talk to everybody before we jump off. I'm going to look at the questions here. How will the file metadata get attached to a file? So um, the file metadata, you're actually filling out your file metadata um, when 
you are on a, a files uh, page here. So let me just actually grab a real file that we'll look at. So if you actually choose one of the files uh, in one of my projects here, grab this one. Uh, right now we don't have that uh, metadata module included here yet, um, but you would come to this this file page and when you or when you deposit a file um, and fill that that file um, metadata those fields out. So right now it's very basic metadata, just the data site um, required metadata. Um, but yeah, you'll have that those additional opportunities to include new metadata fields um, in the very near future. It's a couple of introductions, so hello. All right, so we can continue. And please do submit your, your questions, your thoughts as we go here. Um, so with all of that in mind, considering that many, uh, with some institutions, you have lots of engagement with the OSF already or, or with similar tools, um, they're doing things like this or, or they're, they're wanting to learn how to do more things like this uh, with the OSF, what is, if anything, can be um, gained from that or gleaned from that um, from the institution's perspective? And um, that's tricky um, for a number of ways, and I'm, I'm not telling you anything you don't know here. Um, there are burdensome reporting processes, not burdensome in that you're not doing it right. It's burdensome because they're doing many of them um, in many different formats and many different software uh, platforms that they're trying to do their reporting for their funder, for their institution, uh, potentially for their publications. And they're proliferating tools, not just for their reporting, but their, their stored data storage tools or their, their um, data management uh, protocols, tools, all of those may be different things that are getting spread out. Their citation software, um, not often are those unified. Uh, meeting compliance requirements of, of many, many kinds, uh, mostly uh, the data sharing, depositing data in a place that um, is appropriate for their, uh, based on their funder or their institution can uh, sometimes difficult to get a read on as a researcher. Uh, and then as an institution, you're, you might be able to get a lot of information about publications, you probably can and you probably do. Um, it's less, easy to get information about all the other things that researchers are doing, particularly if they don't result in a traditional outcome of some kind. Uh, so OSF institutions uh, is a, a product built on top of the OSF that um, is, is taking all of that data that we just looked at, that activity we just looked at from individual researchers and uh, distinguishing them by institution um, so that you can actually see the, uh, the activity for your researchers in particular and get more information than, than you would otherwise about what, they're, uh, what kind of work they're doing and where they are in their work and um, where in the university that work is happening. Um, so there's a few things that, that operate together to make this, this data gathering possible. Um, there's single sign-on, which your researchers probably use in a number of, of places now, whether they use their institutional details or they're using Google or Facebook or something, um, that single sign-on really makes that access to the OSF um, much easier by using their institutional credentials to log in. Um, there's a branded aggregate page, which uh, aggregates all of that activity that they're, they're doing at the, um, on the OSF into one place you could see Here's what my institution um, is doing in terms of open and shareable data. Uh, training in order to um, really engage with the potential for the, a lot of this activity across your institution, either as a, um, a general sort of faculty focused training session um, or as a train the trainers type of session where we work with your librarians or other support staff. Um, so that they pick up these resources and use them and, and many of your res, uh, institutions do something like this already. Um, opportunities to integrate your local um, storage tools, local repositories or cloud repositories or other tools into the OSF so that it works much like the add-ons do now. 
Um, and then administrative tools that take all of that activity and then visualize it for you at a, at a level um, that provides some insight into the activity across the life cycle that is not just the final publication outcomes. Um, so we can handle a lot of that infrastructure so that you know, you're not trying to, to manage it across many, many, many different tools and then still turn that into to usable data. So let me show you a couple of those things. Oops, let me switch my windows here. Here. Oops. Screen sharing has failed to start. It's not good. There we go. All right. So this is a, an example of uh, an aggregate page that is pulling in all of the activity. In this case. Um, that we're doing here at the Center for Open Science all across the OSF. Um, and when I'll, I'll click on, uh, well, this very first one, the one I'm working on right now. Um, and that is here because it's been associated, affiliated with the Center. And uh, as we can see, if I go over to the project settings, I have an additional affiliation with uh, George Mason University. I can also add uh, that affiliation that's not accurate in this case, so I'm not going to do that. Um, and when, every time I set up a new project, um, it's actually going to give me, or a new component, we'll start there, uh, by default those affiliations are going to be on. So if you're researchers, um, uh, if you're an OSF institution's member, your researchers have used the single sign-on, um, these affiliations are on by default um, so that every time they start new projects, they um, are going to have those associated with you at the university and they will show up on this uh, aggregate page. Keep going back here. So these collect all of the public projects um, from, uh, from those affiliated users into one place. So in uh, our case, we have a lot of things here. It's probably not a, a surprise um, and we could share this aggregate page to, to give at least a general sense of all of the, the activity that we have going on here um, in addition to just how seriously we take transparency and, and data sharing um, just because of the just due to the activity here we can demonstrate some of this um, and what uh, research institutions have uh, been talking to us about over the last year or so is taking this data and more um, and providing uh, an insight across the institution or within parts of the institution so that they can learn um, more about what their researchers are doing. And so I, I have an example here um, of this visualized as an administrative dashboard that takes all of that data that's happening um, on the USF, all that the work that your researchers are doing that we just talked about and brings them onto a single dashboard for administrators at your institution. Now this one's in our staging environment. The production one uh, is live now. Um, I just don't wanna show off um, somebody's, an institution's live data today, but um, this is an example with fake data of us here at the center. And um, you see our, our individuals that are all participating. And uh, in the case of, institutions that release department level information from their identity management folks we can actually take that too so that we can see where there is clusters of activity across the institution so if you had um, initiatives within the college of engineering to improve data sharing and you held a workshop for them you could check each day to see how those grow after you you hold your your workshop and then total numbers of projects, public and private projects. Um, number of private projects would not be available to you in any other way. Uh, so that's um, so unique information that you can't get from the API or elsewhere. Uh, and then the total number of single sign-on users. Back here. Uh, we don't have any of the, 
repositories integrated yet, but that is something that uh, is getting built or will be getting built very soon. Uh, so I don't have one to show you just yet. Uh, but this is the, the work that we've been doing here with institutions um, and uh, really are excited about the kind of uh, opportunities that that might uh, enable for institutions to learn more about um, the work that their, their researchers are doing on the OSF already. So it's not something new in a lot of cases for institutions. It's just learning more about what's already uh, the engagement that's already happening on your campus. So um, we're really, really excited about this work. Um, so I'm gonna, before we run out of time, I'm gonna look at some of our questions here and please do um, send me questions or um, if you raise your hand, we can uh, have you unmute and talk to us for a moment if you have a use case or a question that you'd like to share. Um, got a question here from Eric. What would workflow look like for transferring static data to an institutional repository? Um, so that would work much like the, the add-ons do now, and that's a case that we're already uh, building toward is um, an institution has a repository that they want to, to get more and more of their research or data into. Um, a lot of that research data is right now on their, their users' uh, OSF accounts um, so that the add-on would enable them to to move that data um, over to their institutional repositories um, through the, the add-on. Um, so instead of copying and pasting or downloading and uploading, um, it all gets moved from the OSF to the repository. Uh, and do you already have data processing agreements with European institutions? Yes, we have several um, institutions in Europe that participate and we have a storage location uh, in Germany. So um, for all, all of the European uh, institutional funder policy requirements for data storage. So far, um, that Germany location has um, has resolved any of those issues, though if, if you know of any other um, storage locations that would be vital in order to enable access for a, a region or, or your community, then uh, please do let us know. Any other questions, thoughts? Yeah, thanks, Eric. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for, for coming and stopping by and, and hearing a little bit more about uh, the USF and USF institutions. I'm uh, I'm going to send a follow up to you uh, today or tomorrow that has some more information and, and ways that we can stay in touch. I would definitely like to hear more about your cases and some of the challenges that you've been faced with um, as all of us uh, have changed our operations a little bit over the last few months. Um, so if there's a way that the OSF or uh, I can help you, please do let me know and, and we'll find a time to, to talk.